Multnomah Group Plan Operations Webinar. Um, we've got a few people, it looks like, still kind of um, coming into the webinar, but I think we'll go ahead and get started and they can catch up as we move along. So um, once again, my name is Bonnie Kreikel. I am a senior consultant here at Multnomah Group, and I am also the uh, chair of the firm's Technical Services Committee. This webinar is part of Multnomah Group's fiduciary training series. We're going to be focusing in today on level two, which is part of a three level series. So um, you'll see as I continue on to the next slide here, um, if, if I can get my technology right and, and do this the right way, there we go, that we've got three levels in the fiduciary training program. And the first level, um, some of you may have already seen, really focuses on just the basics of ERISA and the basics for a retirement plan. So really getting you comfortable with who the Department of Labor is, what is ERISA, and some of those really basic foundational concepts. Then you move on to level two, which is part of what we're going to talk about today in plan operations. We've got five categories there focusing on a variety of different topics such as investments, service providers, fiduciary governance, today's topic, which is plan operations. And that's where we dig into some concepts that you learn about in level one, but we really drill down into some more of these concepts. And then finally, we have level three, which really gives you the actual tools or kind of the practitioner's um, focus on how to take what you learn in level two and put it to practice with your retirement plan. So I'm really excited for those of you who are joining us today. We're going to take one of the, the topics that's probably a little bit more boring or dry plan operations, but I think it's really, really important and we're going to focus on that for about the next um, half hour to probably 45 minutes and hopefully save some time for questions at the end. So, you know, first and foremost, why do we do fiduciary training? Why are you spending your time today on this webinar? Um, it's really important to keep in mind that the Department of Labor wants to see that those who are handling the retirement plan actually know what they're doing. Um, so because you're entrusted with other people's money, the Department of Labor wants to know that you have some knowledge about what you're doing. So that's really important. So one of your action items from today is going to be that you take this um, set of slides that you'll receive after the webinar, and also keep in mind that today is being recorded. So, um, you know, maybe you take the link from today as well as the slides, and you save them in your file cabinet, or probably you have some sort of electronic, what I call like fiduciary file, and you make note of the fact that you spent the time, you know, on 3-19-19 you participated in the training, and you just want to document that so that if the Department of Labor ever knocks on your door, or even the IRS or a plaintiff's attorney, you want to have record of your participation today. So mark that down as action item number one. What are you going to learn today? You're going to learn some concepts associated with just the operational aspects of running your retirement plan, um, some of those day-to-day -day requirements, and then a little bit about government filings and kind of the annual stuff that you have to do with the plan. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and move on to our next slide, which just talks about what is it that we mean by plan operations. Um, by virtue of deciding that you are going to offer an employer-sponsored plan, you really, from my perspective, have three broad categories of responsibilities. So when you say, hey, employees, we're gonna be so generous, or it probably actually wasn't you, it was someone many, many years ago in your company or institution said, we are going to be very generous and we're going to offer this great benefit to our employees, then you ended up with three broad categories of responsibilities, some more glamorous than others. So the first category is investments, and you know that's your selection and monitoring and replacement of your designated investment alternatives, including your QDIA, but that's your lineup that people can choose from. So category one is investments. Category two is your monitoring of service providers. So all of the people who are providing services to the plan, you have a responsibility to monitor those folks. So you've got investments, service providers, and category three is the third broad category, which we're going to talk about today. I think from my perspective, this is the category that actually gets the least amount of attention, but it's probably the most difficult 
it probably has the highest risk in terms of potential liability. It's where I see the most errors occur. And it also has the most confusion from my perspective in terms of people pointing fingers and saying, no, wait, I thought he was doing that or she was doing that. I thought that service provider was the one who was actually supposed to do that. Oh, no, wait, it was them. So plan operations, it's not where you see the big headline lawsuits. It's not where you see all of the training being provided, but it honestly has the most potential for liability where you find out that, hey, 10 years ago, someone checked the wrong box in the, the adoption agreement. No one's ever looked at it since. And now we owe, you know, tons of money in a VCP filing or an audit cap because of it, because the plan operations weren't kicking along the way they were supposed to be and no one ever paid attention to it. So that's really why we're going to focus on that today. And I think today is just a basic primer. You'll really end up coming back and spending more and more time on this as you go along. So keep in mind that because, as I mentioned, plan operations really has a ton of different tasks way more tasks than are involved with monitoring service providers or investments, what most plan sponsors do is they're retaining service providers to help facilitate the accurate and the timely completion of their operational activities for the plan. Um, but the ultimate responsibility and accountability for the completion of these activities is ultimately on the plan sponsor. So you can certainly retain, and I absolutely encourage you to retain service providers to help you with all of the tasks, most of which we'll talk about today, or I shouldn't say most, many of which we'll talk about today. But no matter who you hire to help you, the, the responsibility still falls on you as the, uh, as the plan sponsor, pardon me. So you always have to monitor, um, and you always should assume from my perspective that you are responsible for everything unless it's very, very clearly stated in your contract with the service provider that you've hired them to do something. So maybe their marketing material says, we do this and we do it so well. Unless that's actually reflected in the contract, then you're responsible for it. So let me just give you two quick examples of, of areas where I think this comes up. Um, notices, for example and the summary plan description being one of those notices that you as a plan sponsor have responsibility to distribute to participants. This is a key document of the plan that has to go out to participants. Oftentimes, the service provider or the vendor might prepare that, but then the question comes up, who has to distribute it? And I think there's often an assumption made that your record keeper or your vendor is distributing that for you. But ultimately, you as a plan sponsor have the responsibility to distribute that summary plan description. So that's just one example. Another example where I think there's a lot of confusion would be under loans and hardships. Um, so in the administration of loans and hardships, I think there's very, very frequently an assumption that, oh yeah, my vendor just does that for me. Um, but there's a lot of different components with loans and hardships. Um, and now again, this is if you're offering that as part of your plan. But let's assume you are, um, you know, who's collecting paperwork to support um, a residential loan or to support a hardship? Um, who's reviewing that paperwork? And then who's doing the ongoing administration to make sure, for example, that if, if our plan only allows two loans and now someone's taken three, who's monitoring that? So we won't get in the weeds right now on that part, but that, those are common plan operation issues where fingers get pointed and there's oftentimes this assumption, oh wait, I thought the vendor was doing that. Oh no, wait, I thought, you know, the vendor says, no, you're doing that, you're ultimately responsible. So that's a basic idea of what we're gonna get into today. So um, one thing I would encourage you is as we move into this next set of slides, we're gonna talk about some of the basic components of the operation, and I'm gonna ask you to think about kind of the life cycle of the dollar or kind of how a participant moves throughout the plan. Um, so when we start with kind of how the plan operates, if you think in kind of that life cycle, we have to think about first, who can be a part of the plan? Um, so the first step is participation, determining who should be el eligible, pardon me, to participate in the plan. 
So the type of plan will determine whether certain participants may be excluded from making contributions or receiving employer contributions. Um, so for example, what I mean by that is in a 403B as opposed to a 401K plan, you would be dealing with eligibility issues whereby you cannot exclude certain classes from making their own contributions to the plan. So let me just kind of repeat, participation, we're determining who's eligible to participate in the plan, and we're typically starting with kind of an assumption that everyone's eligible unless they are excluded. And this is where we're gonna to get to kind of a key part that exclusions must be clearly articulated in the plan document. Um, exclusions must be in the plan document. And this is where kind of for the next set of slides, um, including this one, um, maybe if you are multitasking at your desk, which um, I'm not offended by that, oftentimes we all multitask while on webinars, but I would encourage you to do a little multitasking on this webinar, which would be to dig out your plan document, or maybe it's a challenge. Um, if you are someone who works on the plan, you should be able to quickly locate your plan document. So your second takeaway is to, and you can do your second kind of action item from this webinar literally right now, um, find your plan document. So this webinar is not gonna get in the weeds on plan documents, but what we're gonna talk about on the next couple of slides, I'll say, well, participation, or I'll talk about contributions. And then it's going to be based on your plan document. So what I would encourage you to do is right now find your plan document and take a look and see how is participation and then exclusions from participation defined in your plan document. Um, what I find with some of the plans I work with sometimes is that it's a struggle perhaps to even A, locate their plan document, and then B, understand their plan document. So if you learn nothing more from this webinar today, hopefully it's that you have dusted off your plan document, you have it handy, and that you're starting to familiarize yourself with it. Um, some of my committees that I work with, I talk a lot about what are kind of, you know, the five pillars of fiduciary responsibility. And we know that they are acting solely in the interest of the plan participants and beneficiaries, carrying out duties prudently, diversification of plan investments, paying only reasonable plan fees, and the last one, most importantly, is following the plan document. So have that plan document handy and start by taking a look and seeing participation and exclusions from participation. What is it that your plan document says? Um, we do have a tip that we point out on this slide um, that I wanna just make mention of before I move on to the next slide, which is drawing your attention to a couple of areas that can really cause additional confusion when dealing with who gets to participate and who doesn't. Um, one would be if you are with an organization or institution that has a lot of M&A activity or that is part of other organizations, keep that in mind and make sure that all of your service providers know that as well. So when I say service providers, um, whoever is doing your testing, for example, needs to know if you have, you know, a mother organization or five sister companies. That record keeper or TPA, they need to know about that for testing purposes. Also, I would note um, kind of another example of when participation can get um, a little bit off track is when you have, and pretty much I would assume everyone has this issue come up in some form or another, would be the issue of um, folks in your organization who have a change in roles. So this is where you need to make sure whoever's kind of manning the ship on the plan document is talking to whoever's manning the ship with your HRIS or payroll systems. So what do I mean by that? Um, maybe you have a 403B plan and you are, um, you're in higher education and you have people who go from full-time faculty to then working as adjuncts. And so you've got some, some triggers that you need to have set up in your system. Again, making sure your plan document matches your HRIS or payroll systems, and then that's talking to your record keeper so that when someone is changing roles and they need to change for purposes of becoming excluded under the plan document, for example, 
we want all those things to match and talk to one another. Another example could be you've got a 401k plan and you have someone who was an intern and then eventually um, they go from being an intern to maybe becoming a full-time employee when you extend an offer. So again, we want all these things to talk to one another. I'll make one more note before I move on to the next slide, which is just, I hear some, some clients say uh, to me sometimes, well, you know, we're dealing with our health plan and so the health benefits are X. So they take whatever they're doing on the health side and just automatically apply that to the retirement plan. But they're applying something that that's not what their plan document says for the retirement plan. We want to be very cautious that the retirement plan document is the retirement plan document and we don't take other um, laws or regulations and apply that in an inconsistent way to our retirement plan document. So with that, we'll go ahead and move on. Now that we've thought a little bit about what it means to have someone participate in the plan, so we know the who, now we need to think a little bit about, okay, well, how much? So there's two ways that we can get money into our plan. So we know who can do it or who can't do it. Now we need to think about how much they can do and whose money they're going to do it with, right? So there's two ways. One can be the employee's own money, and the other way can be the employer's money. So again, this is where I'd encourage you, keep your plan document handy if you've got it out, um, and, and you know, flip to your section where you're starting to take a look at what is it that your plan allows? What are your plan provisions? Um, so another term you might hear um, when we're talking about contributions, if you're dealing with your service providers, you might hear the term like source sometimes that's going to come up. But let's talk a little bit about the types of contributions and the actual language that, for example, the IRS would use um, or that your plan document is probably using when we're talking about contribution types. So when we're talking about the employer money, there's kind of two different categories of employer money that you might be seeing come up um, in your plan document. So you can have employer matching, and the employer matching is where the employer can make the matching contributions for an employee who contributes. So this is where the employee's got to do something for the employer to then give money. Then the other kind of category, um, and I guess I should note too, for matching, um, the matching can work where the employer matching contributions can be discretionary. So and when we're talking about the discretionary, that's the employer making that determination in a discretionary fashion, not the employee. Um, or they can be mandatory. So the example would be like your safe harbor 401k where it's a, a required matching contribution. Then the next category of employer contributions would be employer discretionary or employer non-elective contributions. So again, you're looking at your plan document to see what you have and what boxes you've checked. But these are contributions made on behalf of all employees regardless of who's participating. So unlike the match where the employee's got to do something to get something, employer discretionary or employer non-elective, that goes to everyone regardless of if the employee does anything. Then we also have the types of employee contributions. So we have the ones that I think we're all most familiar with. So the salary reduction, or rather also called the elective deferral contribution. So those are just your pre-tax employee contributions. Those can come in the percentage of the employee's compensation, or they can be a specific dollar amount. So for example, I want to give $100 per month, or per payroll, pardon me. Then there's also what's becoming very, very popular. Um, I should have pulled the stat before the webinar, but um, the next would be designated Roth contributions. Those are absolutely increasing in popularity. And when I say increasing in popularity, they're becoming available in more and more plans. It doesn't mean that everyone's taking advantage of it, but certainly um, that they are becoming available as an option in the plan. And then the last primary type we'll talk about is catch-up contributions. And those are for those who are over age 50. Um, we won't go into 403Bs also have, um, there's another type of catch-up as well, but the primary type is the age 
50 catch-up contributions. And all of these types of contributions, both employer and employee, have to be specified in the plan document. So that's a little bit on just the types of contributions. Um, along with contributions, you'll want to pay attention to the definition of compensation, which we can do a whole other webinar just on compensation alone. But that's a big area where you get the base definition of compensation, and then oftentimes there are several different variations on the definition of compensation. And that's going to make a very, very big difference in how you know how much to contribute to the plan for each of your individual participants. Um, one thing I will note is that um, I often hear, well, our plan must be running right because, you know, yes, we have these issues related to compensation, but the auditor didn't catch it. And we'll talk about audits a little bit later, but keep in mind that with an audit, um, the audit is a sampling, so they're not going to necessarily catch every single issue that comes up. And so one of the biggest issues we see um, to be problematic is issues related to compensation and the definition of compensation as it relates to those contributions that are being made. So keep in mind that, again, that responsibility, you have selected an auditor, but the ultimate responsibility for those contributions being made the right way, that falls on you as a plan sponsor. And none of this should be taken, I, I realize this sounds very doom and gloom about all your responsibilities, but um, this should not be taken to mean that uh, this is a, a bad job to have, this is all very uh, positive and, and can all be done the right way, we just wanna make sure we understand the responsibility. So let's not get too doom and gloom if it was sounding that way. So we'll, we'll move on to the next slide, which is, um, going to be more focused on the timing of these contributions. So now that we've figured out what you've got to send for your employees, when do you have to send it? Um, this one is another really common question that comes up um, as a consultant to a retirement plan, and it's um, oftentimes confused for plan sponsors or those who are helping with um, the payroll remits. So for those who are familiar with our level one training, you recall that most retirement plans um, they're dealing with, and I say most because not all, but most retirement plans have to um, deal with both ERISA and the tax code, and so the DOL and the IRS. The DOL and the IRS have requirements for the timely remittance of contributions, and we break this down because it's different for the employee deferrals versus the employer contributions. So for the employer side, it's a lot more flexible. So what I'll focus on here is on the employee side. So on the employee side, essentially, the loose rule is that, you know, for larger plans, um, so the ones over 100 employees, you have to have your contributions in within the 15 business days. For smaller plans, so plans with fewer than 100 employees, it's within the seven business days. But that's not really like the hard and fast rule. The rule is as soon as administratively possible. So it's as soon as you can get the money from the trust and get it remitted, that's when you have to make the contribution. So for example, and different auditors and um, different folks from the IRS are going to have you know, a different standard. Some are gonna be more relaxed and some are gonna be more strict. Um, so it probably depends on who you run into. It depends on um, which auditor you have in your office each year. But if you've developed a pattern that you can always get that contribution um, sent in within, um, you know, two days, then your pattern is showing that it's administratively possible for you to do it within two days, and you should be doing that within two days. If your pattern is always six days, then six days is going to be your pattern and that's what's administratively possible for you. Um, so, you know, definitely do it as soon as possible, but I, I, I would um, uh, probably not set a standard that you can always do it in one day, but that's my personal opinion, um, and not the opinion of Multnomah Group. Um, <laughs> so keep in mind what happens, this is always the bigger question, what happens if you have a late contribution? 
Um, if you have a late contribution, then you have created, so let's say your pattern was two days and now it's taking you 30 days. Um, if you have a late contribution, you've created an operational error, which can be corrected via EPCRS, and so that's the IRS correction program. But you may also have created what's called a prohibited transaction under ERISA. And so that would require you to also pay attention to the Department of Labor's Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program. So you want to just keep in mind that um, you definitely need to make a correction if you have a late contribution. So enough on the timing of contributions. Uh, we'll go ahead and kind of continue down our timeline to the idea of vesting. So once money is in, we've got, we know who's going to participate, we know who can't participate, we've got the money into the plan, we've got it in on time, but once the money's in, when does a participant fully vest in that money? Um, probably the easiest answer is to say that um, the participant gets to be um, fully vested 100% in the employer money and the employee money right away, and that's administratively the easiest. Um, but there's drawbacks to that, of course. Um, so what is vesting? Vesting in a retirement plan means ownership. Um, this means that each employee will vest or own a certain percentage of his or her account in the plan each year. Um, so two categories, the employee money and the employer money. For the employee money, we must keep in mind that it's the employee's money. They're always 100% vested at all times in their own money. But for employer money, you could use a variety of different vesting schedules for the employer money. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, from an administration standpoint, obviously it's easiest not to have a vesting schedule because this is where we go back to kind of the finger pointing of who's responsible for administration of the vesting schedule. Is it going to be the employer? Is it going to be the service provider? Are we going to have a TPA help with that? Vesting schedules, depending on how complicated they are, can create a lot of headache if not properly administered. That being said, the benefits, um, they can really help with your budget, for example, and we'll talk a little bit more on the next page about that and what you can use forfeitures for. Um, but they can also help with retention too, right? So they can be a good tool to help with retention. Um, in terms of the different types of vesting schedules, um, so some of you might be looking at your plan documents, you might look to see what are the different types of vesting schedules that you may have. You might have immediate vesting. So again, that's going back to Essentially, that means no vesting schedule. And then there's two other types. You could have clip vesting or graded vesting. And there are limits um, per the regulations as to what the maximum amount of the vesting schedule can be. Um, so for example, you can't have like a 30 year vesting schedule or 30 year graded vesting schedule in a defined contribution plan. That would not be allowed. Um, but for example, you could have a three year cliff vesting schedule, meaning that, you know, 100% vested after three years. Um, graded vesting is that you get a little bit more each year until the maximum amount is reached at the end. So for example, you get 20% after year one, then you're up to 40% after year two, and so forth, until at the end, you know, five years later, you are now 100% vested in your employer contribution. So with vesting comes the term forfeiture. Um, so if a participant leaves the plan prior to attaining full vesting, as we talked about on the prior page, then unvested contributions and the associated returns are forfeited back to the plan, and those are held in the forfeiture account. So this is where we run into questions oftentimes with the concepts of um, what is the difference between a forfeiture account and this notion, um, which this other term I'm going to use has about a million different names, 
but I've heard it called the revenue credit account, the ERISA account, the ERISA budget account, the EDA. There's a ton of different terms. I'm going to call it the revenue credit account for purposes of today. This is again where if you've got your plan document handy, you might try to locate this. Um, the plan document should specify the use of forfeitures, or in other words, how you are allowed to use forfeitures that could be collected. Um, one interesting thing, depending on the document you have, um, for the most part, if you don't have a vesting schedule, this is substantially irrelevant, although there's sometimes um, some oddball times when you could not have a vesting schedule and still, in a couple of odd cases, have a time where you've created forfeitures. We won't go into that today, um, but just keep in mind you could still have that. So um, you probably still would have that language in your document. In general, forfeitures may only be used for offsetting future contributions, paying reasonable plan expenses, or reallocating as additional employer contributions. This is different from the way in which you can use a revenue credit account. Um, so that's why I brought up that term earlier. So a revenue credit account can be used for things like paying reasonable plan expenses. A revenue credit account cannot be used for any of your employer contributions. And so that's a pretty big distinction is that a revenue credit account cannot be used for your employer contributions. Um, one thing that is not reflected on this slide, but if you were taking notes, I would put down a big note related to the timing of using forfeiture accounts and revenue credit accounts. Um, this is an area where I think plans start to kind of get out of control with not out of control, but they, they don't pay attention, I should say, to when they need to be spending both the revenue credit account and their forfeiture accounts. I think a good rule of thumb is that um, both of them need to be spent within the year in which they were generated. That is not a hard and fast rule, but forfeitures, for example, um, in general, I think the IRS guidelines um, suggest that it should be within or close to within a year in which they were generated. Um, and I believe it's the same on the Department of Labor side for the revenue credit account. Um, I will also note that some plan documents, so again, if you've got your plan document handy, definitely check it out. But some plan documents will actually specify the timing with which you must spend the forfeiture. So definitely look to see if your plan document says that um, you want to make sure you are following that guideline so that you are operating within the bounds of your plan document. So that's a little bit on forfeitures. Um, as we continue to the final phase of our kind of timeline of how money comes into the plan and then how money gets back out of the plan, we have to think about how the money is distributed at the end of the road. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one. We do have a blog post for those who subscribe or check out our blog. Um, we've got a blog post coming out on this really soon. And it's got a lot of great information about the pros and cons of various options. Um, but we do wanna keep in mind that there are some common ways for distribution of plan benefits. And what's key to keep in mind is that these are identified in the plan document. I think we get so focused on the plan document identifying how the money goes in and how it is um, monitored in the day-to-day -day operation. We forget about what happens as the money leaves. But you as a plan sponsor have a responsibility to, to take note, pardon me, of how the money leaves the plan, and you have some key decisions to make as to what those various options are. For example, you could set up your plan to say, we are only going to allow lump sum distributions, full lump sum distributions, and that's it. But if you've only checked that one box, and that's the only box you've checked, or that's the only um, option you've articulated in your um, attorney drafted document, then you need to make sure that you're coordinating with your service providers to ensure that that's the only way money is going out of the plan. 
Um, if you've then got other options happening, then you wanna make sure that's articulated accordingly in your plan document. So um, more on that on the blog uh, within the next week or so, um, but make sure that your plan document matches the distribution options that are happening with the vendor. The next section of the webinar is fairly timely for the time of year that we're in for, for a substantial amount of plans. Uh, in that we're gonna kind of move out of the phase of kind of the timeline approach, and we're gonna move into more of the annual compliance phase. And we won't spend a ton of time on this today, but one of the things I wanted to suggest um, is that it could be helpful for some of you to think of this in terms of your annual compliance process and to make sure that if you are still more um, unfamiliar or new to this process, you might want to make sure that you coordinate some sort of vendor call um, at the beginning of this process each year until you become very familiar with this process. Um, so for example, what I mean by this is the next series of slides is going to talk about your annual testing, your annual reporting to government agencies, as well as your annual audit requirement. And what I find to be helpful with some of my clients, um, especially if you have a 403B plan, for example, is that we try to do a call perhaps each January or February with the um, auditor, any of the vendors or service providers who have to supply data, the auditor, and whoever's going to prepare the Form 5500, as well as myself and the plan sponsor. And all of these parties get on a call and we talk about the entire timeline for this annual compliance process. We talk about how the audit will be prepared, how any information from the audit will get to the person preparing the 5500. We talk about each person's role and responsibility and the timing of that and how we'll meet all of our deadlines. Um, so that's just one kind of takeaway tip. If you find that you have a very cumbersome process, you might find that to be helpful. So in terms of kind of the first um, part of the process, non-discrimination testing, uh, we want to keep in mind that retirement plans must not discriminate. Um, highly compensated employees may not receive a disproportionate benefit relative to the overall plan population. Um, we want to keep in mind that there are a variety of different tests. So when you are working on hiring a service provider to do your testing, you want to be very specific in what tests you are asking them to do for you. Um, if you're unsure what tests you need to have performed, maybe start there and say to the service provider, hey, what, you know, here's a little bit about my plan and my plan document. What tests do I need? Um, when we're talking specific to non-discrimination, uh, common tests are the ADP test, so the actual deferral test, the ACP test, the actual contribution test, and then oftentimes, even though it's not actually a non-discrimination test, the top heavy test is also lumped with that. Um, but what you'll find is that there's a variety of other tests that are run at the same time that are testing things like making sure people didn't go over the contribution limits. That's commonly referred to as testing as well, and it gets lumped in there, and oftentimes the same service provider is doing that for you um, but it's not actually a non-discrimination test. Um, so you might just want to keep that in mind. We won't go into all the common remedies. Um, another thing I do want to point out, though, before I move to the next slide, is that um, you want to make sure that the testing that you require will depend on your plan type, and that can mean a couple of different things. So for example, um, checking your plan document right now could be very helpful if you've got it handy. Um, things like if you have a safe harbor plan, one of the reasons people have safe harbor plans is to avoid some of the testing. So I'll throw that out there for your consideration. Another concept is that 403B plans, for example, they are subject to the concept of universal availability. So that is also eliminating one of the tests, which would be the ADP test. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have no testing requirements. They're just eliminating one of the tests. Um, so with that, again, if, if non-discrimination testing or testing in general is a concept that is 
something you're not that familiar with, um, I would certainly encourage you when we have um, the level three presentation to make sure to tune in there because I think um, testing can be a very complicated issue. The next area of focus is um, each year there is a requirement to do reporting to government agencies. And the most common one that ERISA covered um, plans are very familiar with is the Form 5500. And the Form 5500 applies to all sizes of plans, even plans um, that are small plans. They just do a short form of the 5500, and then large plans are doing the, um, the longer form, which does require an auditor's report to be attached to it. Um, so going back to my remark a moment ago, that it could be very helpful if you have some sort of coordinating meeting or call at the beginning of your year each year to kind of get the flow of how um, the testing will be completed, uh, the 5500 will be prepared, and when the auditor um, will have their report ready to be attached to that Form 5500, particularly if the person um, preparing the audit in 5500, if those are all different entities. Um, addition, additionally, um, you have the Form 5500, but there are also requirements to have a Form 1099-R and then the Form 8955-SSA. Um, on the 1099 and the 8955, I very commonly see that the service providers do the heavy lifting on those. Um, that being said, going back to the remarks at the beginning of the presentation, even though service providers oftentimes do that for you, I would not take that for granted. You need to be very clear about the roles and responsibilities of both of those um, forms and how and when those will be uh, distributed. I want to get to two other quick items before we wrap up today um, and then make sure we've got time for a few questions. So um, the next two kind of go hand in hand, um, compliance, and then we'll wrap with um, the audit requirement. So compliance is the concept of just making sure that you are aware of all the concepts we talked about today and of course many more, as well as the notion that it's best if you can do your own internal controls and internal compliance checks so that you as a plan sponsor or employer or committee, that you are finding your own errors as opposed to your auditor, which we'll talk about on the next page, finding those errors for you. And definitely instead of the Department of Labor or Internal Revenue Service finding those errors for you. Um, Certainly one best practice could be um, having, you know, some sort of third party do like a fiduciary audit for you from time to time. I don't think that's something you need to do annually because you likely do have an annual audit if you are a large plan over 100 participants. Um, but I do think it's a good idea to have good internal controls and occasionally do some sort of kind of a step back and, and do a check on yourself to make sure that you're keeping up to make sure that you're um, operating in line with the terms of your plan. If you ever do have uh, the Department of Labor or the Internal Revenue Service knocking at your door, I would also suggest that it's a best practice to, um, you know, don't, don't just uh, immediately respond, but take, a, take note of what they're asking for, um, potentially engage some sort of outside counsel, and then make sure that you um, take inventory of your fiduciary file and respond accordingly. The last concept we'll hit on today is the audit requirement, which goes hand in hand with the um, annual kind of process we talked about. Um, as we talked about, large plan sponsors are subject to the annual audit requirement, and audits can be full or limited scope um, when we talk about full or limited scope, most of the plans um, that I work with are doing what's called a limited scope, and that is per the Department of Labor that they are allowed to do a limited scope audit. Um, one of the reasons to do a limited scope is that from a time standpoint and a budget standpoint, it is much more efficient. There are many parts to an annual audit. Um, a lot of it is going to be testing of internal controls, 
Um, and there's uh, several different components and people who are definitely going to be involved um, in your day-to-day -day, uh, retirement plan committee work, but you'll certainly want to make sure you have the compliance and operational issues um, ready to be evaluated as part of that audit. Um, as a best practice, I think it can be good to present back to your retirement plan committee um, what the findings of the audit were, and then perhaps report that even up to if you have some sort of board or subcommittee of the board that you report to. Um, oftentimes, wherever your committee charter is coming from, that can be very helpful as well. Um, so with that, we've covered a lot of different ground today. Um, I will go ahead and kind of wrap it to the um, to the this is what you have learned slide, and we will work on wrapping it up for today. So um, I'll take some questions. I think we've got one question coming in now, and then we will wrap up the presentation. So let me pause while I field the first question, and we'll go from there. So one of the questions we have is, um, you mentioned that we should track training. Should we be tracking the training each fiduciary member completes? Um, really, really good question. I think that it is a great idea um, to the extent that you can, obviously. The more that you could track in terms of what training was completed by the committee during committee meetings, as well as by each individual fiduciary committee member, the more that you can do that, the better off that you're going to be. Um, certainly, there's going to be um, limits to how much of that you are able to do, but the more that you are able to, um, and, and I apologize, I think that there's a bit of technical difficulties that the PDFs have frozen, so I apologize for that, but everyone will receive that final screen that just summarizes what you know. Um, in a follow-up um, email. So I'll just take some questions and then be on the lookout for that follow-up email um, with the slide. So I apologize for the technical difficulties there. Um, so back, back to the final kind of question at hand, which was um, how do you track or should you be tracking the, um, the information that um, fiduciaries are doing for training? I think absolutely that's a great best practice. Um, for anyone who is familiar with some of the 403B litigation, um, that happened over the past two years, starting in August of 2016. One of the cases was the NYU case. And in the NYU case, um, there was some pretty strong language from the judge that even though the case ended up in favor of NYU at the district court, some of the language, and I don't have the case handy in front of me, but some of the language was really, really strongly worded about basically the ineptness of the committee members. Um, and I think having really strong documentation to show that your committee members have sat through trainings like this or have done other trainings, whatever training you're putting them through, I think that's going to be fabulous documentation and evidence in the event that you are ever subject to some sort of litigation or even just having the Department of Labor in your office. So um, great question. Definitely try to track each fiduciary committee members um, training to the extent that that is feasible. Um, another question came in, um, is there a recommendation for how many training hours or trainings each member needs to complete each year? Um, again, really, really good question. I think that there's going to be a really fine balance there, right? So we definitely want to have people um, who want to participate in the retirement plan committee, so we don't want to make this overly burdensome. But at the same time, we definitely need to make sure we have people who are educated and able to fulfill the responsibilities of a retirement plan fiduciary. So I don't have a hard and fast rule for you on this, but I do think that there is going to be a fine balance that you should reach with your third party consultants, as well as then probably your committee chair. Um, the other person or people that should be involved in that decision would probably be if you have the board who's making the delegation to the committee, someone from that board who has oversight should probably be involved in, in helping with the decision of 
how much training is necessary because ultimately they're responsible for the monitoring. Um, just from my own practical experience, I would say if you have quarterly meetings and there could be at least some training component, Multnomah Group certainly recommends some training component, even if it's five to 10 minutes at the end or leave behind, that that can be a really, really great start. Um, and then one kind of longer training each year as a refresher, that can be a really great start on a fiduciary training program. Great, great questions about the training component. Um, another question came up that I will probably let um, Lindsay from our marketing team field um, if she's able to, to chime in, but it's the question of just how do you get to the blog that was mentioned earlier? Um, so, Lindsay, are you able to take that question? Sure. Um, I can see the question. So, I'll go ahead and send an email to that okay. respondent with a direct link to the blog so that he can get to it. Um, but the general response is, if you go to multnomahgroup.com and you click on our blog um, link in the navigation, it gives you a big box where you can type in your email address and subscribe to our blog, and then you'll start getting um, the blogs directly to your email. Awesome. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, one other question that we had um, was for those fiduciaries with responsibility for monitoring plan operations, is there a good checklist which can be used to help document compliance? Um, that's a great question. I think there are a variety of different answers for that. Um, one starting point, so Multnomah Group certainly has what we call our annual fiduciary program, and that's our kind of checklist for assisting plan sponsors with that. So what we do is we try to take and, you know, different different uh, service providers, I'm sure, have different variations on this. But what we've done is we've taken um, the four quarters with which we're meeting with clients and divided up the operational tasks and tried to identify them on a quarter by quarter basis um, so that we're helping kind of check all those boxes with clients. Um, we certainly encourage clients to take that and to customize it for themselves and to then assign different um, stakeholders to that to be able to then kind of document as they go. Um, if you don't have um, that through access to working with Multnomah Group, I'm sure other service providers have similar things. Another thing I might recommend is the IRS has, I, I find that the IRS has some pretty good resources. The DOL may too but I've found a little bit better luck on the operation side through the IRS website. So for example, if you type in Google IRS plan operations, um, which I'm doing right now, they have some pretty good resources of checklists for all of the different things to run a retirement plan. So I think you can find a page, retirement plan operations and maintenance. And it gives you a pretty good start to some of these things. And then they've linked to various pages. So it's not exactly a, a checklist with fill in the blanks, but that gives you a lot of these concepts in more detail. And then you can link to things like the Fix-It Guide from the IRS. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the Fix-It Guide from the IRS, it's where any time you have a problem with any of the things we talked about today, if you have a problem or you, you mess up essentially, then that's the IRS's way, their fix-it guide of telling you how to fix those problems. So those would be my tips, um, I think, for those issues. Um, so with that, I think if there's any other questions, we'll certainly take those now. We can always feel free to send a follow-up email, um, and we're happy to field that as well. Great, well, I'm seeing no other questions. Um, I apologize for the few technical glitches today, but thank you, thank you so much for all those who joined. Um, please remember to you know, keep your plan documents handy and use those as you operate your plans, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Have a great day.